Hello. This is John Burke, Principal Research Analyst and CIO here at Nemergis Research. Welcome to our webinar today entitled Work From Home Success Tips, presented by Erwin Lazar, Vice President and Service Director, and myself. Today's webinar consists of an interactive presentation and a moderated Q&A period. Feel free to submit questions at any time during the course of the webinar using the control panel, and we'll do our best to answer all of them at the end of the session. And although we don't send out copies of the deck, a replay of this webinar will be available in the channel shortly after the presentation. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Erwin, over to you. Great. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction, and, and thank you to everyone who is able to join us today. Um, so hi, I'm Erwin Lazar, Vice President and Service Director, as, as John mentioned. And um, let me go ahead and jump into the agenda. We'll go through some quick introductions, and then we'll talk about some of the work from home success tips related to uh, foundational technologies and, and approaches, some of the, the tools and tips around collaboration, and then some of the, uh, I almost want to say psychological tips around community and how you can foster, uh, continue to foster business community within your organization as well as within customers, partners, et cetera, uh, as, you're, as you're engaging work from home. And then we'll wrap up with uh, some, some additional tips and, and how we can help and so on. So let me jump and start with introductions. For those of you who are not familiar with Nemertes, welcome. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, we are 18 years old now. We uh, spend our time going out and gathering data from end user organizations. So everything that you'll see in our presentations is based on real, real world research that we do, where we go out and we interview organizations. We gather data through surveys. And our goal is, is really twofold. One is to, to help you understand where you are with respect to technology option, uh, so allowing you to benchmark yourself against your peers, but maybe more importantly to, to help you understand what are the characteristics of successful approaches. So in everything that we publish, you'll see uh, success metrics where we define quantifiable benefits for different technologies, and then we look at what are the characteristics of the organizations that are achieving the highest measures of success. So again, our goal here is to help you understand what are successful companies doing differently, and you'll see a number of data points from our studies as, as we go into this uh, discussion. And then quickly, to, uh, from the technology perspective, we cover a variety of technologies. Within this presentation, we'll mostly be talking about collaboration, which falls under our digital workplace research area, as well as, as network, which falls under our next generation networking. We'll also probably touch on things like cloud analytics and automation and so on. We also cover cybersecurity and risk management, digital customer experience, as well as Internet of Things. So just to quickly introduce myself, um, I've been working from home now since 2007, almost 13 years. Uh, I lead our coverage around unified communications collaboration, what we, what we call workplace collaboration here, so things like calling and video and team uh, applications as well as uh, some of the non-real-time applications related to project and task management as well. Uh, work, you know, spend our time gathering data and working with uh, on a consult consultative basis with both vendors of technology, service providers, as well as, as with enterprise organizations. And just uh, this week spoke at the virtual Enterprise Connect. Unfortunately, a lot of those conferences are not uh, not happening this year, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get back on, on track at some point later this year and into next year. John, go ahead and uh, when you go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Thanks, Erwin. Uh, so uh, like Erwin, I've been working from home for a long time now, since 2005 when I joined the Murdys. So 15 years for me, Yahoo. Um, and I lead our coverage on cloud and networking uh, and automation topics broadly, including AI ops for you know, bringing artificial intelligence into network operations. Uh, and I consult with uh, organizations of all types on those technology areas, as well as operation strategies more broadly. Uh, I assist in our coverage on security and IoT. Um, before joining the Murdys in 2005, I was in the IT business for uh, 18 years in a variety of roles, uh, ranging from you know, uh, director of networking to enterprise architect. And um, uh, yeah, so I actually got my start with Nemertes, if you will, uh, as one of the people that they used to call up for research in interviews. And so you know, I, I did a number of interviews on, at the time, cutting-edge technologies like VoIP, and uh, uh, 
uh, in 2005 uh, jumped, the, jumped the fence and uh, got onto the other side of the phone conversation. So it's been a, a long and enjoyable ride so far. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to Erwin. Great. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Yeah. And just uh, for for a point of reference, we are a completely virtual company. We uh, we have uh, we don't have a physical office, so we've we've been in the work from home space now for uh, since our company's inception in 2002. So let's talk a little bit about work from home success and um, to kind of draw a parallel about the you know to put a model in place about the things that you should be thinking about, both as a worker as well as a manager, an IT person, uh, a person responsible from maybe even an HR perspective. Uh, I wanted to draw in the Maslow hierarchy of needs and, and sort of try and paint a little bit of a parallel to a work at home hierarchy of needs. So if you think about Maslow, it starts with you know food and water and and safety and shelter and a uh, sense of community, belonging, recognition of, uh, for your for your efforts, and self-actualization. We have that freedom to, you know, pursue your own interest, and a lot of that really maps, you know, tightly into thinking about how we how we can succeed from work at home perspective and, and we'll talk about the foundations from work at home. You know, what are the what are the, the core elements that, that are required in order for work at home to be successful? How can you continue to do your work with your peers and with your customers and partners and so on through a collaboration perspective? And then how can you maintain your sanity uh, working from home? Uh, how can you continue to feel like you're part of a team, to continue to feel like your work is being recognized? So we're going to kind of frame the context of, of this discussion within those three core areas, and uh, hopefully, again, that gives us a little bit of a framework to think about as you're, you're developing a, a work-at-home strategy for your own organization. So, John, let me turn it back to you and, and talk a little bit about some of the foundations. Uh, sure, and uh, although it caught us, as a, uh, a nation and as an industry somewhat unawares, um, it is interesting that what enterprises have been experiencing as a result of COVID isn't so much uh, completely different from what they were doing before as a, a, a vast acceleration of changes that they were already uh, seeing, already learning how to deal with. Um, as we've moved into uh, uh, an enterprise context defined by providing enterprise services out of uh, a broad selection of clouds, uh, you know, ranging from SaaS solutions to uh, infrastructure you run yourself in an IaaS or PaaS uh, uh, space uh, to the stuff that you still have in your data center, and uh, on average, an enterprise still has 40% of its workloads running in its own data center. Um, IT's had to be thinking about and preparing for and redeveloping and redesigning its networks to handle uh, traffic that starts on the outside of the enterprise uh, or that ends on the outside of the enterprise or both. Uh, we saw in our most recent round of network research in January, February, that uh, the classic inside the inside use case for the wide area network now accounts for a little under 40% of WAN traffic overall, and the rest of it is either starting inside and going outside, starting outside and coming inside, or, and this is the germane piece, uh, starting outside and ending outside. And uh, that's, uh, that's the COVID work from home use case for a lot of folks. They come in via a corporate VPN, they touch the network there, and then are, you know, essentially routed back out to a SaaS solution to software that they're running in AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. That's, uh, that was already 17% uh, of network traffic, again, in January, February, before COVID-19 hit. And so uh, this vast push to work from home is uh, forcing enterprises to deal with rapidly ramping up their support for that scenario, uh, scaling up infrastructure, uh, on the internet connectivity side, and we see a lot of folks, you know, turning up their dynamic bandwidth or getting an additional broadband link in, uh, and also uh, having to scale up their VPN connectivity. And we think because we're expecting more work from home episodes uh, over the course of the coming 18 months, uh, you know, on the, the realistic timeline uh, for a vaccine, that uh, as they scale these things up, they're, they're basically going to be making permanent changes in capacity rather than simply and only temporary ones. 
One of the biggest changes that we see coming down the line right now uh, is a shift from a traditional VPN infrastructure where you as the enterprise uh, run appliances in your network uh, that allow people to connect uh, from the Internet into your network and resources uh, to a, a more cloud-like uh, version of that where the points of presence for the VPN service are distributed around the country. Uh, people connect into the closest one and then from that point on are carried uh, on a, a, a private middle mile, if you will, that can connect them to uh, public cloud infrastructure, private cloud infrastructure, their own data centers, SaaS solutions, uh, all with the option for uh, IT to uh, see and manage what's going on and apply a policy about you know who's supposed to have access to what, uh, like a cloud access security broker allows to a more limited extent now. But it's this melding of uh, private middle mile connectivity of CASB type um, application of policy and a, a distributed cloud on ramp that is going to define the sort of next generation of secure uh, cloud access and policy enforcement, you know, our, our acronym SCAPE for that. We see uh, Palo Alto Prisma, Cisco Umbrella, uh, offerings from Cato and even Ariaka, you know, moving in this direction rapidly. Uh, and it's going to actually integrate into, fold into what people are doing around SD-WAN as well. So uh, as the crisis unfolds and as it becomes more status quo to support uh, much larger numbers of, of folks working from home, uh, we're going to see uh, a massive uh, increase in the use of solutions like this. <clears throat> and uh, we're also seeing that IT staffs are having to uh, do something that they maybe did a lot less of in the past, which was help people with their at-home work environment. Uh, a lot of organizations have had a fairly hands-off approach to that. Uh, if you can get to their internet face, you can work from home via that using a VPN, for example. Um, or if you've uh, got a client for the VPN on your device or on your, your laptop, you can connect in that way. Um, but we're starting to see that because so many more folks have had to start working from home who maybe never did in the past, um, we're seeing IT staff having to uh, assist with assessment of uh, wireless infrastructure, both uh, in-house stuff and uh, stuff that's uh, provided by carriers like 4G or 5G services, and with selecting services that will help people uh, get the most reliable performance in their homes as they're working from home. We've seen uh, a rapid ramp up in the use of either uh, small office, home office appliances, or software appliances, for instance, running on a laptop, uh, for connecting individual staff into an SD-WAN infrastructure, uh, or, or <clears throat> multiple folks if they happen to be, for example, in the same, in the same apartment building. Uh, we're seeing that rapid ramp up in the evaluation of SCAPE solutions and the cloud-based access and policy control. Uh, and we are seeing businesses reevaluate and try to come up with funding models that will help uh, enterprise employees defray the cost of improvements to their home connectivity or uh, in-house Wi-Fi if those are necessary in order for them to work from home. Uh, finding ways to either reimburse staff for that or pay for it directly or um, offer uh, a, sort of a, a, an installment reimbursement for it instead of a, a simple lump sum. Uh, we're, we're seeing where folks don't have sufficient bandwidth, uh, you know, maybe they've only got an old uh, copper line into the house, they don't have cable-based broadband, we're seeing folks looking for alternative solutions. Uh, a lot of times that's going to come down to uh, a 4G, 5G hotspot, depending on where people are located. Uh, and we are seeing IT staff looking at all of the resources that they have available to them in their enterprises and <clears throat> all the places where in their infrastructure they can prioritize the traffic for work at home uh, staff 
over uh, some of the other traffic that's occupying their networks at the time. Uh, you know, specifically, that's going to be prioritizing uh, real-time communications tools and the traffic associated with them over any kind of bulk transfer operations, backup operations, uh, email, web browsing, etc. Uh, and so that's making use of uh, several different layers in the infrastructure, uh, ranging from uh, MPLS traffic classes, if you have those in place, and QoE, QoS settings uh, at the network level, through uh, SD-WAN policy group configurations and uh, tweaking the prioritization of those. So a broad set of approaches possible. And, and lastly, uh, we see IT uh, providing advice and guidance on folks who are trying to uh, make the right environment for themselves in their own homes as they're, as they're trying to work there now. Uh, you know, everybody, I think, understands the need to find a, a quiet or a comfortable place. Um, not everybody would automatically think, let's have two monitors, but it is an enormous boon to those working at home if they can have uh, both the small screen on their laptop and a bigger screen to work from. Uh, it helps prevent eye strain and other kinds of physical stress uh, in an extended work-from-home environment. Ideally, every work from home environment will have a door that closes. Um, uh, we've seen a lot of novel solutions to that. And, uh, you know, if there's not an actual room, uh, like a, a, an office, a den, uh, even a dining room available for people to close the doors on, we do see folks uh, closing themselves into bathrooms, walk-in closets, uh, even not walk-in closets, <laughs> um, as long as there's room to sit down, put a laptop on your lap, and uh, close the door. Uh, you, you can have uh, a quieter and more uh, secure conferencing environment uh, for the length of whatever meetings you need that much quiet for. Ideally, you'll have a desk or a, a desk type table. Again, ergonomically, you don't want to be working on a surface that is forcing you into positions that uh, damage you, that exacerbate your uh, repetitive stress injury, whatever. <laughs> Excuse me. And lastly, if you're new to working at home and building a work environment for yourself, uh, do the same kinds of things in your home office that you would do in your office at work. Uh, if you're not in a hardcore hoteling environment, you likely have uh, stuff pinned up to the whiteboard that's just yours. You have little knickknacks on your desk. You have photos up on the wall uh, next to you to remind yourself of life outside work. Um, do all the same kinds of things in your home environment. Try as much as possible to to take whatever opportunities are available to make it fun. Uh, at Nemertes, we're, we're having a lot of fun playing around with virtual backgrounds, um, and uh, uh, April Fool's Day was especially good for that one. So, uh, you know, work with what you've got to try and make the environment more humane uh, as you work from home. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Erwin. Awesome. Great, John. So uh, let's move up the, the stack a little bit and talk about collaboration. And there are really two core technologies that we see as being critical to work at home success uh, because, you know, gone is, is the opportunity to walk down the hall and, and ask a question, to, to get together with folks for lunch, to have in-person meetings and so on. So we want to think about how can we continue to maintain that level of interaction for people who are working from home. And the, the core technologies are – uh, team collaboration, the, the apps that, that allow you to create contextual workspaces, um, lots and lots of ones out there. I can go through the entire list of names, but you know, uh, Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx Teams, Slack, um, Ring Central, Glip, uh, Zoom Meet, Unify, and, and, and so on and so on, Avaya Spaces. I'm sure I'm leaving vendors out. I always hate to go through the list in case there are vendors on the call who I accidentally omitted, but uh, lots and lots of, of, of uh, vendors living in that space that provide the ability to set up contextual spaces around uh, projects, around functions, and engage in persistent communication. So getting communications out of email into more of a chat-based uh, centric capability where you have integration into business processes, into other business applications, and you eliminate the need to move back and forth between different applications to get work done. And the second are the meeting platforms, often 
tightly integrated with team collaboration that provide uh, integrated audio conferencing, video conferencing, screen sharing, and a lot of additional features like polling or broadcast type capabilities. Uh, like I mentioned, they may have their own chat capabilities built in. They may have the ability to transcript or work with partners who, who provide that kind of, of capabilities. But these are really the two core foundational technologies that allow people working from home to be able to engage, do ideation, to, to handle tasks, to handle projects um, on, a, on an ongoing basis, and to have a much better experience in, in doing virtual meetings when, you know, again, you don't get to see your coworkers uh, on, a, on a frequent, if, if not at all, basis right now in the, in the environment we're in now. And as we look at, at each of these areas, uh, I want to share with you some of the success factors that, that we have seen. Um, the first is around team collaboration applications, and there are really five kind of key areas that that, uh, that that you need to think about in order to help, in order to make these applications successful in your organization. Um, the first is that you have a plan for addressing security and governance. Um, it, a lot of times we see that these applications were brought in by individual work groups. You know, they heard about uh, companies using s certain apps or they were using them in their personal life and they decided, you know, hey, let's get off email and start using an app. And, and that may be happening outside of corporate governance, corporate security. So you need to think about things like archiving and retention, uh, controlling access to the applications and to workspaces within the applications, um, in use of encryption, uh, how you handle guest access, both for guests coming into your environment as well as your employees potentially being guests on someone else's environment and what data can be shared. Um, a single sign-on is, 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 is going to be a, a critical part of it. So thinking about having a proactive security and governance policy, and we've got a number of, of uh, papers and, and reports on our website that cover this, so we'd be happy to go into greater detail if it's something um, you know, you, you're struggling with. Um, the second is to think about company-wide adoption. Often, as I mentioned, a lot of these adoptions happen virally, where individual work groups, often uh, within IT and software development is, is, has been a big one, they go out and they get an app and they start using it, but everyone else in the company isn't on that app, or there may be multiple apps within the organization. That chart in the bottom right shows that when we looked for uh, success metrics, we defined a group in a study that we did of about 635 companies. We looked for a group within that, that, that 635 set of organizations that had achieved measurable value for their collaboration investments, meaning they had saved money, they had generated new revenues, or in most cases they had achieved productivity improvements, measuring before and after times that decreased as a result of, of using collaboration applications. And half of that group had deployed team collaboration company-wide versus only about 23% of, of the rest of, of the, of the, of the uh, pool. So there was a strong correlation that if you are using a team collaboration application and you've deployed it to everyone, not, not just back office, but customer service agents, uh, even front uh, or even um, field uh, workers to, to allow them to, part to get help to solve the challenges that they have regardless of where they're, they're located by having that persistent means of communicating that it does correlate with success. Uh, another big correlation was thinking about team collaboration as a work hub, meaning it's not just a messaging application, but I'm going to integrate workflows into it. I'm going to integrate CRM and ERP and HR and project management and other kinds of applications, maybe even custom data uh, flows so that I can engage with data and I can engage with the people I work with around that data all within the context of that team space. So I can onboard an employee in a team space. I can look at a sales report and ask my sales team, hey, you know, what's going on with the, these accounts? I haven't seen an update. Or, hey, I just got an update from our CRM that popped into a, a channel for a specific uh, client that said that, you know, their, their contract is coming up for renewal. So, again, kind of thinking about all the different ways that you can integrate data flows and applications into that team space. Fourth key success factor is distributing out the management of those team applications, meaning that you know, IT shouldn't be the one responsible for creating channels. IT shouldn't be the one responsible for you know, making sure that we have right channels for right job functions. You should be able to uh, push those out, allow people within lines of business to create channels, to, to archive them once you've hit a, a certain point where they're no longer necessary. And you should also be thinking about how you can automate and even distribute channel onboarding. So if I hire a new salesperson, I want them automatically to get access to the right channels for their, their particular need. You know, can I tie that 
into a, an onboarding uh, capability through HR that defines if their job title is X, then they automatically get access to you know, Y set of channels. And then most importantly is move off of email, I think. Uh, we found the companies that use team collaboration applications, um, roughly about 19% of them are seeing reductions in email. And that we think will continue to grow as organizations increase the use of their team collaboration applications and they become a viable alternative to email. Uh, and then really the big one is getting buy-in. You know, if your boss is still emailing you, uh, you're not going to spend a lot of time in the team collaboration application. So if you want to see all these benefits that we talked about, we've seen other benefits in terms of reductions in meetings and you know, identifiable productivity gains, you, know, you have to be able to tell that story about why we should be conversing in our team space versus you know, I have to go and read an email and loop other people in and forward it and go, you know, all the challenges you have with trying to find information in email. Um, looking at uh, just overall types of tools growing in, in collaboration, this is from a, another study that we just published, uh, let's say Thursday, published it on Tuesday, um, that was based on about 565 companies, North America, Western Europe, and so on. And we looked at what uh, features within applications are growing in use. So these aren't specifically the apps, but what are you using within those apps? And you know, over the last uh, 2019 into 2020, it was web conferencing, aka screen sharing, the ability to share content re remotely, and um, and room-based video were, were really the big growth areas. And uh, obviously, the study was taken before the the pandemic and before people shifted out of rooms and into home video. But I expect you'll see big spikes in mobile video as well as desktop video. We did see growth of north of 50 percent. In, in both of those. So being able to support all those different means of, of communicating and collaborating, especially now that people are working from home, is critically important. And I want to share a couple of video success tips, and, and I you know, apologize for the goofy picture, but as John mentioned uh, in, his, in his part of the presentation earlier, you, know, you have to make collaboration fun. You have to make communication fun internally and externally. We're, we're all in a very stressful environment right now, and anything you can do to alleviate that stress is going to lead to, to a, a better experience, I think. But just thinking about some of the, 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 the things you want to look at in terms of, of being able to support uh, video collaboration specifically, you want to think about lighting. You know, if you have a very bright window behind you and, and no light in front, you're going to appear very dark, which is why in that picture I have on the slide, I actually look pretty dark because I think it was sunny behind me. Um, but if you can have a dark background, draw some curtains, uh, you know, experiment with different lighting approaches so that you don't look washed out. Think about uh, getting a good desktop lamp that has uh, some variation in, in, uh, in, in the ability to do different shades and so on. Uh, make sure you have a good headset or or and a, a speaker phone, um, something that's light to wear. Uh, we're finding, you know, in our company now, we're doing a lot more video calls, a lot more uh, conference calls than we than we were as as our clients um, move to work from home, and we're not able to meet with them. So, you know, this week would have been the Enterprise Connect event in uh, Orlando that went to a, a virtual event, and a lot of those meetings that had set up there ended up, you know, translating uh, transforming into online meetings. So, having a, a headset with a long battery life that's comfortable to wear. Uh, some folks may enjoy a, or find better fit in a, in a speaker phone, uh, Bluetooth or USB, but make sure you've got a high quality audio device. Um, you know, take advantage of the fun capabilities that are out there. You know, some of the providers have uh, backdrops. I've seen um, you know, the, the Twitter has been full of, of people pushing out virtual backdrops for, for Zoom, and uh, Microsoft is adding that capability. I saw you know, the sports themes one. Uh, this one is from The Office, for those of you who are fans of that show. Of course, there's, there's Tiger King backdrops that are floating around now, but, but make it fun. You know, uh, you know, again, don't feel like it has to be this formal experience that we used to think of with video where I had to get dressed up and it had to be this you know, high-quality uh, experience just like it would be in the office. Um, and you know, the other problem that, that folks tell us and, and in, our, in our experience we've seen around video is when you're on an audio call, a lot of times it, you, you get up, you walk around, you're thinking, you know, you're, you're doing things so you're not just sitting at your desk. That, that changes when you're on a video call. So especially for long video calls, take breaks. Um, understand that it's okay to get up and walk around, but most importantly, make sure you have pants on if you do get up and walk around. Uh, there was a, a, a report out the other day that saw that Walmart has seen a massive uh, increase in sales of dress shirts, but not necessarily corresponding uh, increase in sales in pants. So just something to, to keep in mind. But again, it, it, it requires a culture of 
you know, again, I want to keep saying inform, informality that allows people to not feel like, you know, you're on camera, you have to be looking at the camera the whole time, especially if it's an internal call and if it's a long internal call, you know, accept the fact that, that people are going to get up and walk around. Think about solutions that will enable you to move from mobile to desktop. So if you do want to go make yourself some lunch or get a cup of coffee or something like that, you can stay on that call uh, while moving it off to, to your, your mobile device. And then um, the last part that I want to focus on, or second, uh, last part I should say on collaboration is, is thinking about management. And as John alluded to, you know, this really, there was, there's always been a historical, I think, approach from IT that they didn't worry much about home workers. You know, that's best effort. You know, you're working from home, good luck. Um, that really can't be true in a work-at-home environment. So you need to have insight into the performance of those applications at home, and you need to be able to uh, not only react to, to problems, but hopefully identify them in advance. So if somebody is working in a home office that's in a dead spot in their house, you need to have the tools to, to help them understand how they can extend Wi-Fi capability, or as John mentioned, you know, maybe if it's even something you pay for and, and offer. Um, if they have poor Internet connectivity, uh, you know, think about are there options for, for higher quality services. But it all requires insight into the performance of voice and video and messaging applications. Uh, you want to think about things like utilization. You know, are people using the apps that are out there? Are they turning their video on? Uh, are they paying attention? You know, so if they're multitasking, this is, uh, you know, it, there is always the challenge when you're working at home of, of more distractions than you might have if you're in a, you know, a traditional office environment or even an open office where you know everyone's looking at your screen as, the, as they walk by. And then you want to understand what are the challenges that people are experiencing. So are people happy with the tools that you're providing? Or are they finding that, you know, look, it's really not meeting our needs. We, we have needs X, Y, and Z. And I think more so now than ever before, it requires that two-way communication between IT and the line and, and the end users to understand what's working and what's not, and to you know accept the fact that this isn't going to be a one-time. Here are your tools. Good luck. We'll see you you know in a year. But this is going to be a continual evolution as companies learn what works from work at home, um, as employees kind of get comfortable with with what works for them and making sure that you continue to fine tune your, your strategy as you go forward and also taking advantage of you know, some of the newer capabilities that are beginning to emerge like AI and I mentioned things like note taking and, and so on. And then lastly, security. You know, John alluded to and talked about this quite a bit earlier, uh, but as you start to have people working from multiple locations, you now have potential concerns around uh, are you opening yourself up to additional attacks, especially if they're coming back into the enterprise to access internal applications. Um, how do you ensure that they're installing security patches? Uh, what are the security concerns that, that you need to be aware of? So. Again, John talked about some of that earlier on, but you want to have a proactive approach to what are the policies that I'm creating around these applications, especially if they're new, and you know, say you're just now rolling out a team application or a video, meeting video application. What are the policies that, that I need to have in place? How do I make sure that they're configured properly, and how do I look for uh, 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 violations, attacks, anything that, that might go wrong in, in, uh, in the use of, of some of the emerging collaboration tools? So moving up the stack, I, I want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about, you know, I guess what we've seen in our experience and, and just in talking to some of our clients about the, the need to, ma to effectively manage people that are working from home. Both, I guess sh I should say both self-manage as well as manage if, if you are in, in a management position or if you're in an HR position or so on. And really the key is to stay engaged. It can be incredibly isolating if you have gone from an office where you know, you've, you've been working there for years, you're, you're really close with the people you work with, you go to lunch every day, you talk about kids and family and, and so on to, to an environment where you are now you know, staring at a laptop and then hopefully a second monitor screen and having some video calls throughout the day. So uh, as a manager, I think it's really important to talk to folks um, to, to get on the phone or a video call, ideally once or twice a day, you know, maybe in the morning and in, in the evening. How's everything going? How, you know, what, what, what do you need? What, what challenges are you, are you facing? This will be especially true as people are, 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 are working from home for the first time uh, that really aren't used to that environment. Uh, one of the big challenges that often comes up in, in some of the studies I've read about work from home is that people don't feel like they're being noticed you know, that their work is not being noticed. And this was more of an issue, to be fair, 
when you had work at home plus people in the office. So, you know, the, the people in the office maybe had greater visibility. But now that everyone is work from home, maybe it's the differentiation isn't or disparity I should say isn't as big, but you still want to make sure that people know that that you know you, that what they're doing, their efforts are being recognized. Uh, one of the things that we've seen happening a lot lately has been social get-togethers using some of the video tools that are out there. So happy hours, uh, hey everybody, let's meet your family, let's take an hour and play some games, you know, do something that uh, breaks up the the monotony, I guess, of sitting in a, in a home office all day long. Uh, for those of you who have the time, take advantage of some of the online learning capabilities that are out there. There have been a number of, of classes that have been established, a lot of free offerings that are out there now. And use maybe that two hours a day that you used to drive to and from the office and listen to an audio book to do something for yourself, uh, whether that's working out or reading or, you know, again, taking an online class so that you have, uh, you know, you have some positive gain from that time that you're now saving that you're not sitting in your car. Um, following up on the community, you know, just thinking more about the, the self-actualization, uh, uh, I, I guess, part of, of, as we talked earlier at the, at the beginning of, of the Maslow, Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know, what are the things that you can do that we found that you know, works for helping people uh, survive that, that work from home environment. You know, getting some exercise is really critical. I've talked to a number of folks in, in, uh, recently that have found that you know, if there's one factor that really correlates with uh, happiness of work from home, it's you know, take a walk, go for a run, do something where, where you're, uh, you're able to break away from the desk, obviously you know, following uh, whatever rules are under in place right now for uh, social distancing uh, or physical distancing or so on, but uh, taking that time for yourself. Um, thinking about work hours, uh, this is maybe a little bit more from a management perspective, but be flexible. Some people like to get up at the same time every morning, sit at their desk, do their work, check out at 5 o'clock, go have dinner, and, and you know, follow that regimen. Other people that work from home prefer more of a flex time. So as, as much as you can accommodate the working styles of your employees, go ahead and do that. Uh, we've seen some interest now in four-day work weeks. Uh, there have been a couple of studies that have shown uh, one uh, out of Japan that, that uh, or uh, the, the adage, um, Adam Grant has a wonderful work-life balance podcast where he, he talked about the adage of um, work will expand to meet the available time. So the amount of hours you have for work is commensurate with the uh, amount of, of hours you need for work. So if you shorten to a four-day work week, people will be more productive. They'll actually get the same amount of work done. So there have been some experiments that have shown that that works. So again, something to think about. Um, you know, I mentioned take breaks, walk around, get up from the desk, uh, smartwatch or, or, or uh, Fitbit or something like that is a good device to remind you to get up and, and go for a walk. Um, talk to people. You probably, you know, a lot of you have uh, family in, uh, that are home now that are out of school. Um, if you're in that environment, you know, take advantage of that time with the family, have, have meals with, with family and so on. Um, continue to maintain outside engagement. So uh, you know, talk to your friends and family. Uh, take advantage. You know, continue to participate in any social groups. Uh, I'm very involved in scouting. And last week I did four video calls every uh, Tuesday or Monday through Friday. Uh, I'm sorry, Monday through Thursday last week we were on video with different scout groups that, that I'm involved with. So um, even more video calls, uh, you know, than 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 I had just uh, during work hours. And one I'm going to throw out there, maybe a little controversial, because I've heard other people say the exact opposite. But I think it's um, it's important to you know kind of focus on work in, in order to survive. There's a lot of you know, really bad, terrible news out there right now, given the, the where we are right now, at least here in the United States and in Italy and Spain and so on, with with uh, COVID-19 cases increasing and unfortunately fatalities increasing. You can find yourself getting extremely distracted and extremely depressed if you're looking at that stuff all day. So, uh, you know, maybe stay off of, of uh, social media, you know, check on the, the news and social accounts in the morning or during lunch in the evening, whatever. But uh, it, it, it's a tough challenge to, to break away and, and not get yourself uh, depressed, but you know, really just try and focus on, on work during the, the work day, I think, is, is critically important. So with that, um, I'll wrap up with uh, just some, some key takeaways. You know, so and we'll open up the for Q and A in a minute. Um, you know, obviously we've seen this uh, shift, unlike anything we have ever seen, both from a, an economy, from uh, a work from home perspective. Uh, this this is uncharted territory for for the planet. Nothing has ever happened globally like what we're seeing right now. 
Uh, but ex so expect hiccups. You know, have it, have it be be flexible, be relaxed in your attitude. There are going to be lots of challenges along the way. There are going to be service outages. There are going to be problems with bandwidth that we talked about, security problems. A lot of these have, have happened very rapidly in the last week. Uh, think about the, the foundations. You know, make sure that that, that you're 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 engaged with your employees so that you know what their network environment is at home and whether or not it's sufficient for their needs. Uh, think about uh, the tools we talked about. You know, use video, use team collaboration. Um, one of the, the topics that came up, I'm going to give uh, credit to a fellow analyst by the name of Tim Banting during a, a call we did recently with the IMCCA, uh, a, video, a video industry group, was you know, everyone's talking about social distancing. and That's a terrible term. Um, you should socially engage with people while you physically distance. Keep that six-foot barrier between people, but don't disappear socially. You, know, you, sh you should continue, and, and, and for mental health, I think it's really important to socially engage with, with coworkers and, and peers and so on. And we did put together a list of um, expanded work-from-home technology options. Uh, either free options or services that have expanded their free offerings. Uh, the link is there. If you uh, go to our website and you click on resources and blogs and go to my blog, you'll see it. It's a third or fourth post. Uh, we continue to add to that as we hear new uh, offerings. So if, if you're missing anything or if I'm missing anything, please let me know and, and I'll add your service onto it. So with that, John, um, I guess uh, let me just talk real quick about our upcoming research and then I'll, I'll flip it back over to you, John. Um, so we are currently starting a, a study on video collaboration. Uh, this has changed quite a bit, as you, you might have imagined, uh, in terms of what we're looking at. So you know, we were looking predominantly at video conferencing, endpoints, room systems, and so on, but we're going to focus a little bit more on how people are using video at home, uh, how are they supporting um, video capabilities for, for home workers, remote work, and so on. Uh, from a management standpoint, we'll look at streaming and, and broadcast video and, and uh, use of, of some en emerging endpoints like digital whiteboards, which you know, can be often used for home workers. So if you're interested in participating in that research, we would love to have you as an interview candidate, in which case you'll get a copy of the results, or uh, if you're willing to participate in a survey, we'll give you a gift card. Um, please contact me at the email address that's there, or I believe it's in the attachment and links part, portion of Bright Talk, and we'll get you signed up. We don't share your info. We don't name anyone who's participated. We don't share any identifiable info outside of Nemertes, uh, so we'd love to have you participate in our research. And this is only open to end users of technology. We don't allow vendors to participate in this research. And then John, I'll just cover this real quick and then we'll go, um, we'll, we'll go into Q&A. Uh, so we did set up a quick start virtual workshop that allows organizations to essentially have some of the tools and benchmark themselves as they think about how do I quickly get up and running to support work at home. So we'll provide a customized blueprint. We'll provide best practices, a lot more research behind what we talked about today. So if you're interested in that, we have it on our website, uh, again, under research tools, as well as uh, just contact us at sales at Nemertis. So with that, John, I think I'll turn it back over to you. OK, great, Erwin. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I did unmute my phone. Yay. Uh, before we go into the Q&A, I'd like to draw everybody's attention to some other stuff first. Uh, starting with uh, what's coming up next in our webinar series. Uh, we will uh, be back on Thursday, April 9th, so that's just next week, uh, at 11 Eastern with uh, part one of our cost benefit analysis series uh, on expanding video. Here's how it's delivering success, uh, which will be presented by Robin Garris, who is our president and one of the founders of Nemertes. You can register for that webinar by going to the Attachments tab and clicking on the registration link. And uh, there's plenty more going on on the Attachments tab. Uh, as Erwin just mentioned a moment ago, we'd love to have you participate in our research if you are an end user of these technologies. And if not these technologies and participating in the next study, then in a future one. On the Attachments tab, you'll see a link to participate in our research studies. It will take you to a form on our website. You can fill it out, uh, including which areas uh, you're uh, able to respond on, and we'll be in touch for future research. Uh, as thanks for participating in one of our research tools, our research studies, uh, you will receive complimentary access to that study's results. And uh, as always, 
thank you if you decide to participate. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and your sharing with us your insight. There's also a link on that uh, attachment tab to our Quick Start RFP offering. Uh, it will take you to our website where you'll see the description. You can download the details of the PDF if you want to uh, chew on it at length. Uh, but that's just another uh, uh, sort of shrink wrap uh, offering that will allow folks to uh, short circuit their RFP processes, really get a jump on them uh, using us as a resource. Lastly, uh, you'll find uh, an infographic link on the attachments tab as well. Download that, have a look at that. And as always, uh, please do connect with us. You'll find on the attachments tab a link that will take you to the contact us form on our website. Uh, please let us know what's on your mind or uh, how we can help you. I will leave the uh, for more information slide here up as we proceed into the Q&A section. And let's get going. We do have a fair number of questions here. Uh, starting with, can we get the slides? Uh, I will reiterate uh, and for folks who joined late, um, the slides. We don't distribute the, the deck per se, but a replay of this webinar will be available in this channel shortly after the webinar finishes. So you can uh, have access to the material then and that way. Let me see. Now, uh, diving into the questions that we have. Um, Erwin, I know this is something that we've done research on uh, to some extent in the past, which is sort of client sprawl. Um, how do you control the ask for yet another collaboration app? Uh, the, the person writing it says, we have Teams, we have WebEx, Spark, and now we have departments that want Zoom. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I think the, the, the challenge there is to understand what the issue is. You know, why can't they use the, the, the apps that are available to folks today? Um, what are the, the, you know, what's driving it? In a lot of cases, it may be, hey, we, you know, We've heard about you know, pick on uh, you know, site Zoom as the caller as the uh, attendee did. Uh, you know we've we've heard Zoom. We heard it's better than what we're using. We want to try it out. Um, you know the the challenge there again is if you are going to allow another app, you need to make sure you're doing so in a secure fashion. So it, you know, does it support all the security controls that you need? Does it support things like single sign-on, retention, and, and archiving, and so on? Uh, but if there are specific reasons why people are not happy with the app portfolio that you have today, you, you really want to understand those. And you know, if, if it may be a scenario where, you know what, the, this app that we, we're providing people today doesn't meet their needs, so we're going to let them use something else, that's fine. Um, if if, if you're in a, an environment where you know you can't tolerate uh, additional apps because of security compliance governance concerns, you know the answer may may be no. But uh, again, you really want to understand what's driving people to ask for additional apps. I mean, a lot of the discussions we're having around why people want to use Zoom right now is virtual backgrounds. That's been the, the, the cool fad. So uh, I know uh, Microsoft just announced that they're adding support for that. Uh, I assume Cisco will at some point as well, as well as some of the other ones that are out there. So uh, if that's it, though, if that's your only reason, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to justify an additional expense, an additional uh, tool that IT would have to worry about just for something like that. Great, great. Um, thank you. And I think that actually polished off a, a different question as well. Uh, someone asked what tool we're using right now. Um, this tool is BrightTalk. It's its own thing. Um, and uh, it's a platform for doing this kind of webinar. Uh, let me see. Uh, what uh, is uh, the difference? Just to comment on that, cause someone asked why are we not using Zoom. Uh, the big reason for BrightTalk and why we use it is it's a almost like a YouTube channel. So uh, you'll get an email afterwards that provides uh, the replay of this webinar, as John mentioned earlier, and it'll also give you access to all of our other webinars. So we use this as, as a content management system as well as uh, a webinar platform. Right. Thank you. Uh, and what is the difference between web conferencing and desktop video? Yeah, so web conferencing, we, I mentioned, uh, we define that as screen sharing. So those are the features that people are using, not necessarily the applications. For you know, for years, there were dedicated web conferencing applications that didn't include video. Um, applications like uh, GoToMeeting, you know, back in its early day. Uh, today, you know, we define the meeting application as one that includes audio, video, 
screen sharing uh, and, and some of the additional features I talked about earlier. So that was, we say web conferencing there, we're, we're really just looking at screen sharing as a feature and how often that's being used. Great, thank you. And uh, another person has asked, uh, earlier when talking about feature requirements for users of UCAS, uh, video voice presence, et cetera, uh, when was that data collected? Do you see that changing with the uh, uh, coronavirus in environment that we're now in? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so most of the data we public that that I cited was from a study we did in mid 2019, looking at uh, plans for the end of 2019 as well as 20 and 21. Uh, about 506. I'm sorry, 635 companies based in uh, North America, Western Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia. Uh, the one chart I had about the features that uh, looked at web conferencing, video, and so on, that's from the study we published on Tuesday. Uh, similar scope of companies, but uh, about 560 companies. I mentioned we're doing a study on uh, really looking at video that's kicking off uh, the week of the 15th. And again, we'd love to have you participate in that study if you're willing to, uh, to be part of an interview or, or um or, or take a survey. So uh, I expect, you know, as we've seen, just a massive uptake of video, of team collaboration, talking to a lot of the vendors have published some of the stats of what they've seen internally. And, you know, the, this is uh, unprecedented growth in, in these technologies right now. And if you're interested in participating, I, I will encourage you once again to go to the attachments tab and click on the invitation to participate in our research, which will take you to uh, a form to fill out on our website so that we know what to contact you about. Um, let me see. Uh, has anyone looked at the expanded attack footprint we are creating by sending so many people home at once? Um, yes, that is a source of enormous discussion in the security community. Uh, and Erwin, I'll, I'll hand off to you in a moment to talk about the collaboration tool side of that. But um, yes, there's a lot of talk about uh, whether folks are using a managed endpoint or a personal machine, uh, how secure home networks are, are they using uh, a firewall of their own? Are they using the security sort of cloud firewall functionality uh, that some of the connectivity providers offer? Like if you're, if you're on uh, a Comcast home internet, uh, they have security features that they basically now roll into the cost of it. Um, uh, and other providers are doing the same thing in their own uh, service spaces. So uh, yes, there's a lot of thought about that, uh, a lot of interest in technologies that are built to help in that kind of a situation like virtual desktoping. Uh, a lot of uh, ramping up of DI infrastructures and accelerated adoption of desktop as a service offerings uh, from folks like Microsoft and Amazon and others uh, to get around the security of the endpoint per se as much as possible, uh, as well as uh, increased interest in and use of those uh, escape solutions that give you, you know, VPN-based access, uh, you know, after basically the first hop on the internet. So yeah, there's a, a lot of different angles being uh, approached on that security of the home environment question. And then Erwin, I'll hand off to you for security of the collaboration tools themselves. Yeah, I think the biggest issue is uh, going back to one of the earlier questions is people just saying, you know what, I'm just going to go and start using an app. Um, I don't like what IT provides, and if I don't have a lockdown device or if I have a personal device, you know, I'm going to start using apps without uh, IT knowing about it. So, yeah, there, there are definitely concerns, um, and, and it requires, like we talked about earlier, um, having a, a proactive strategy to make sure that you're communicating with people and, and understanding if, if there are if they're not happy with the tool set that you're providing and your only answer to them is, you know, tough, this is what you get, uh, use it or, or don't use anything, you know, that's really not the right approach. So uh, you can alleviate, I think, a lot of the security concerns through two-way communication. Great. Uh, let me see. And I, I think you've answered part of this question, but uh, it's a great way to, to round it out. Um, do you have recommendations for making video calls efficient and productive? Are there best practices for structuring calls to allow time for late joiners or people who have trouble connecting, for example? 
Yeah, so we talked a little bit about making the video calls more effective from a quality standpoint, so things like lighting and so on. But in terms of, of structure, you know, having an agenda, making sure that people know what the expectation and the goals for the call is are really important. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Edward Tufte data visualization approach, one of the, the techniques that he talks about is not, not expecting that you're not going to share any information until the meeting starts. So if you're giving a presentation and, and you want folks to, to review that, to, to, to know what you're, they're getting into, I guess, um, prepare some notes ahead of time. Prepare a one-page document and send that to people ahead of the meeting and use the first five, ten minutes of the meeting for everyone to read the, the document. And then the rest of the meeting can be a drill down into specific questions or areas, uh, as well as um, the uh, you know, uh, really just a Q and A that, that might occur, or you know, okay, here's here's what we talked, here's what I had in my notes. Now we need to talk about you know an action item or how we go forward. So that to me is one of the real interesting uh, ways of, of just improving meeting dynamics in general, especially for virtual meetings, is, is to do that homework up front, to write that one or two page document, distribute it, give everybody a few minutes to read it, and then now everyone has that common core set of knowledge and you'll find I think some of the studies that, that, Tuft, uh, that uh, Professor Tufte cited have shown that people tend to retain the data a little bit more and you're not dealing with the scenario of you're presenting for 25 minutes and half the time that you're presenting somebody's not paying any attention they're going off and doing something else so that would be one one uh, one technique that I would strongly recommend looking at greater one thank you that that's wonderful advice and that looks like all the questions that we have for now. So uh, many thanks to everybody who has participated and for everybody who's been taking the time and giving us their attention and asking such great questions. Uh, uh, one last time, I'll say that the webinar uh, will be available as a replay in our channel shortly, usually less than an hour after the end of the re uh, webinar. Uh, if you have found this valuable, please feel free to share a link to that replay with your colleagues. And please take a moment to rate the webinar and to send us your feedback. It's much appreciated and it helps us shape future content. If you haven't already, do check out the links on the attachments tab and check back in our channel often. We post new content pretty regularly. With that, I will say thank you so much one last time for joining us today. And this concludes the webinar.